Hi, this is Mike Carley from Loudoun, Tennessee, and I play at Teleco Village Toqua Golf Course. This is Golf Smarter number 963. During my 20s, in addition to being an avid golfer, I also played a lot of billiards, including some competitive billiards. I was living in New York City at the time, so you can imagine there's some good pool players out that way. And I had the chance to play for the first time on what's called a tight pocket table. It's a descriptive name because it's tight pockets. And so what they've done is they've put wood shims into the sides of the pool pockets to shrink it by probably a half inch on both sides until it's barely bigger than a pool ball. It's really challenging. You miss a lot of shots. It's very exacting. But as soon as you switch over to a regular pool table, you feel like you can't miss. It almost feels like cheating. The pockets just feel so big. For sure, I think that experience was floating around somewhere in the back of my mind. Simplify and fine-tune your putting practice and warm-up with Putter Cup by Matt Davis. This is Golf Smarter, sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. A little heads up about this episode before we begin because there's more today than what you're expecting. When I first recorded today's episode, it felt a little shorter than what I usually deliver. So here's what we're going to do. This week, we're going to feature two guests on two different topics, which is going to make this episode a little longer than usual. Hope that's okay, but it's a podcast, so you can pause it at any time, right? Now, if you remember a couple of months ago, PXG sponsored Golf Smarter to talk about their new Black Ops driver. I went out for a fitting, recorded it, and then used that recording to create the ads that ran in the podcast. Well, a couple of weeks ago, I was very pleased to hear from my agency that PXG has renewed for another run. Once again, PXG invited me back out for another fitting, this time for Fairway Woods, a hybrid, and irons. Yeah, I can honestly say that Part of my love of doing this podcast is I get some pretty cool perks along the way. But here's what I wanted to explain. I learned so much from the fitter, Brandon, and found the fitting process to be so interesting that I wanted to share it with you. Now, next week, the PXG campaign is going to begin, but what I'm including in today's episode is completely my choosing, and in no way did PXG or my agency suggest that I do this, nor am I getting any extra compensation for including this in the episode. The full fitting was about 90 minutes, and I've cut it down to under 30, so you won't hear a lot of ball striking or downtime, and much of our conversation was tightened up to remove the dead space. I learned a lot during the fitting and felt it was worthy, because I'm pretty sure you'll get something out of it too especially if you've never been fitted for clubs, which can make a huge difference in your game. This is my fourth club fitting since I started playing golf in the late 90s, and each time as my game progressed and I've learned more about how to be a better, smarter golfer through the podcast, getting fitted definitely improved my game. But for now, welcome to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Matt. Oh, Fred, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for having me today. Well, it's my my honor to have you on the show because I love talking to people with unique and interesting ideas. And when you get an idea that's as like slap the forehead, why didn't I think of that idea, <laughs> is exactly what you did. Um, and this is something your product now sits in, I'm just teasing this, but your product is now in my golf bag for uh, all the time because when I get to uh, warm up for a round, I use these because it does help. What we're talking about is a brand you've created called Putter Cup. Please explain Putter Cup for me. Yeah, um, it's it was a tough name to come up with uh, because it's it's not necessarily a, a cup, but it certainly uh, is is part of putting. Um, and so I, I can I have them here and I can show them to you. Uh, we currently have two products that are out in market today, a third one that's, that's coming down the pipe pretty hot. 
Um, but these are golf hole inserts. So they are, they are to be inserted into a golf hole. And uh, they're really based on this premise that it's my personal belief that putting doesn't need to be overly physical, overly mechanical. Um, it's a very simple act, but we can complicate it uh, pretty quickly. And so <laughs> yes. these are really uh, meant to be counter to that. And so one of them is called the speed bump. And I'll hold it up so you can see. It, it creates this 360-degree raised incline around the golf hole, which does a couple of things. It forces you to make sure you're not leaving it short primarily. That's kind of one of the big ones as you're thinking, I have to hit it hard enough because there's this little bit of resistance. But then there's the secondary benefit of because it's this 360-degree ridge, if it's offline at all, it can also get deflected even if you have say the right speed and so once you're standing over a putt especially the short ones like six feet and under uh, and your knees might start knocking this is meant to kind of help clear the noise and give you something really simple to think about which is i'm going to just try and get it over this bump um so that's that's one of them uh, and let me just say that the golf smarter community is probably aware of these products because you actually were an advertiser on Golf Smarter, and we oh, wow. appreciate that very much. Um, so I have talked about how one of my favorite parts about a training aid that doesn't it it doesn't require batteries, or it doesn't require you to plug it in at night or download anything. It's just a putting aid that is simple, concise, and pretty easy to figure out as soon as you get your hands on it. Yeah, and I, I'm a golfer. I've been playing for for 30 years. Uh, at at various times, I've gotten the handicap down to single digits, depending on nice. where I'm at with my family life and you know the progression yeah. of things. The fact that you get to uh, play golf, yeah, uh, which I hope to play more of here in the near future. But um, I've I've purchased training aids as as much as anybody, and uh, I grew up uh, without a ton of formal golf instruction. Um, I was largely self-taught, give or take uh, a little bit of guidance during the summers when I'd get to visit my grandfather, which is whom I learned from, mm. but certainly no formal instruction when it came to putting. The The biggest lesson I ever got was firm in the back of the cup. And that was usually when we were playing, you know, for a nickel or something like that. And uh, I'd have a four-footer. Wait, your grandfather was gambling with you? We'd play match play for five cents a hole. Yeah. Wow. That was by the time I was, that was, that, that was by the time I was uh, probably a teenager. Um, okay. So then you had a nickel. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wait, wait. And if you, if you, uh, he beat you, did you have to pay up? Oh yeah. And he uh, made you pay by then more often on, than Rams. not, I was winning and he had oh, a dime that he kept on his bureau until the day he passed. And it was oh. one of the, one of the days that he, he took it from me. And he let me know about it. Oh, yeah. Great story. Yeah. Uh, but not a ton of formal instruction. And certainly right. not when, when it came to putting. Uh, even full swing. I didn't really get a ton of instruction until my adult life. And um, got into the world of trying out training aids. And the ones that I, that I tried with putting were reflective of what's out there today. A lot of it is focused on either getting you to stand a certain way or to take back the putter just a certain way and have kind of a, a uniform arc to your putt, um, all in the name of trying to get it started on your starting line perfectly. But the more I used those, the more I would find myself frozen on the actual first screen because mm -hmm. all of those visual things were not there anymore. Or you have to set them up in just such a certain way that you're taking the same putt over and over and over, which might help you groove a, a putting stroke. Um, but you rarely get the same putt twice once you're on the golf course. And so <laughs> That's they, for sure. they didn't, they didn't stick with me. Uh, and oftentimes I felt like I was thinking more about whether or not I was taking it onto the golf course. And I wasn't thinking about the objective that was in front of me, which was you got to get it into that hole. Or if you can't get it into it, make sure it's a, a very easy tap in. And so um, these training aids, putter cup, kind of ref reflects that that upbringing, that approach to putting, which is it's it's it should be simple. 
you know, you can hand a kid a putter and within minutes they'll start figuring it out without a lot of formal instruction. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a, uh, golf smarter listener and Thank it was, you. uh, it was just a few weeks ago uh, that you replayed. I, I took a note. It was an episode with uh, Mr. Manzoni, uh, mm-hmm. where he he kind of gave a bit of a, a speech on on putting and and the importance of keeping it natural and not trying to manufacture anything. And while I never had the honor of meeting the man, I think uh, he would appreciate. Uh, and agree with with some of the key design principles that I had in place with these because it's really so far away from mechanics uh, or trying to manufacture a stroke. And it's really more about just making more putts with whatever stroke you have. Yeah. And I apologize to the audience for both of us holding up visuals uh, for yeah. an audio podcast. So we'll we'll continue to do our best to describe exactly what we're talking about. Um, what I'm holding here is probably one of the early iterations of this. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So um, I am a uh, I'm not out of my garage, so I can't officially say I'm a garage uh, startup. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I am a, what, what can be called a, a solopreneur, an entrepreneur solo, uh, kind of stepping no, no, no. out into this, to, to this world on my own. And yes, yeah, so, um, I, I went through the process of, um, working with a computer assisted design firm, uh, so that I could get my 3d renderings kind of ready for manufacturing and, and kind of learning all about how to translate that into injection molding and some of the limitations that come with you know, how small of a shape you can make and produce reliably. And so, yes, Fred, uh, the ones that I sent you back a few months ago, that was uh, of our, our first batch, our soft launch mm-hmm. uh, batch, uh, reflecting kind of V1, version one of the design. Uh, and we do have our, our second wave coming. We, we did make a couple of tweaks to one of the products, and we actually have a third product uh, coming out as well. Well, the thing that I am so attracted to uh, this conversation and why I would why I was excited to talk to you is I like talking to solopreneurs um, as one myself. And, but I'm always curious, like, where did the idea come from? How did you decide? Oh, wait a minute! This is a potential product that could work. Yeah. So there were there were two. Uh kind of more obvious inspirations behind it. So one is uh, during my 20s, in addition to being an avid golfer, I also played a lot of billiards, uh, including some competitive uh, competitive billiards. And uh, I was living in New York City at the time, so you can imagine there's some good pool players out that way. And uh, I had the chance to play for the first time on what's called a tight pocket table. And hmm. Uh, it's a descriptive name because it's tight pockets. And so what they've done is they've put wood shims into the sides of the pull pockets to shrink it by mm. probably a half inch on both sides uh, until it's barely bigger than a pool ball. And I remember it's really uh, challenging. You miss a lot of shots. Uh, oh, it's, very exact, it's very exacting. But as soon as you switch over to a regular pool table, you feel like you can't miss. It almost feels like cheating. Uh, The pockets just feel so big. And so for sure, I think that experience was floating around somewhere in the back of my mind. Um, And then it makes total sense. Yeah. Uh, And then secondly, uh, I'm up in the Seattle area and we have a local now chain of um, mini golf pubs. It's called the flat stick pub. Uh, I've gotten to know the owners over the years. They're, they're wonderful guys. Uh, but when they first opened, they had these tiny cups, uh, just like a tight pocket table. It felt like they were barely big enough for the golf ball to get into. Really? And I remember that after having played there a few times, once I was out on the golf course, I was visualizing their cups uh, because it was so exacting. Uh, and I, I found myself making more putts because of it. And so... Uh, a couple of, um, I think just, again, those are like visual representations, things that I've experienced that I think 
were were kind of floating around in there. And then I think there was just this kind of great convergence of some of the life experiences you have to have uh, once an idea comes to to figure out how to make it happen. Um, I've always had an entrepreneurial bug ever since childhood. I was the kid who was <laughs> knocking on doors asking if I could mow your lawn for a few bucks. Um, and awesome. that's just, you know, that, that's always, that's always been part of who I am. And then certainly a love of golf. Uh, I've, and I've been playing since I was 13. Um, I could never stop. I love it too much. And so certainly those two parts of who I am have floated, floated around for a long time. And then I had the chance to just be uh, lucky in my life. My, my wife grew up doing professional ballet and I had the chance to watch her coming out of the pandemic start a ballet studio and start her own business. Um, I, my career by trade has been market research, corporate market research for almost 20 years, which has functioned as a great slow cooker for some of these kind of inner ambitions of, of learning how to kind of take something uh, that's an idea and put it all the way through into how you bring something to market. And so there were these, you know, uh, aspects of life that were happening. And then I'd had these kind of design inspirations for, you know, what can help make people better at something uh, just by concentration. And mm -hmm. so uh, it was, um, it was November of 2022. Uh, we have two young kids and one of my kids uh, woke up that night. I was feeling ill. So we attended to him. And before I could fall back asleep, just uh, the idea for the speed bump popped into my mind. And wow. I, I reached over and kept my wife from falling back asleep. Thank, thank you to my wife. Uh, but I said, <laughs> hey, I, I think I just had an idea for something that I think any golfer could use. You don't have to be um, a scratch. You can be just starting out. You can be any age because it, it operates on this principle that putting is 90% mental and you will make more putts just by concentrating and keeping your mind clear a bit more. And it started with the speed bump uh, over the next few days. It kind of uh, morphed into the second product, uh, which is the center cup, which is more of a traditional hole reducer. Uh, there's, there's no kind of bump to it or anything. It just shrinks the size of the hole by an inch. So it's, it's a bit more like a tight pocket table design. Um, I can, I can tell you uh, I've seen, hole reducers out there. This is not the, the first hole reducer that's existed. The thing I like about it though, trying to figure out how to insert something into a golf hole is not as straightforward as you might think uh, because there's variation in what's out there in the world. And so um, with my, my first crack at it, I thought to myself, well, a golf hole is four and a quarter inches. They're all four and a quarter inches. And so I'll make the speed bump fit in a golf hole that's four and a quarter inches. Well, that's not exactly true. Uh, depending on what course you play at, uh, you might have varying cup styles, particularly on the practice greens. And um, some golf courses have cups that go right up flush to the surface of the ground. There's no gap for a putter cup to fit into. And so that was a good learning. Uh, and uh, you'll be happy to hear. Uh, and I'm happy to get you a, a V2 uh, oh, thank where you. we've uh, we've adjusted that kind of base portion of the product so that it can fit into any golf hole, um, including uh, you know the ones that, for example, indoor golf facilities might have a turf practice green. You can use putter cups there as well, yeah. and yeah. so uh, it addresses that issue because those almost never are the full four and a quarter inch golf right. hole. Right, and there. that was the first thing I did is I've talked about that I have a practice putting green in my backyard, and I went right to it. And just tried to reduce the size of the hole mm -hmm. um, just to make sure that my entry point, you know, is a lot more concise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, I, I, I've heard you mention a couple of times you recently switched over to the, the DF3 uh, from lab. I, too, have. Uh, and, and now you're doing a DF3 on the broomstick. You, I don't have the broomstick. Uh, yeah, just, I just uh, moved over to it. I've just played a couple rounds with it, and I really like it. Yeah, and I'm a complete lab rat, so. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was going to ask if you'd heard that term because that's what some some friends of mine are, are now calling us. 
Uh, yeah, actually, they even now have merch with the oh. Lab Rat logo oh, nice. on it. And my my putter head cover is the Lab Rat. Is the Lab Rat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I... I'm not saying that I came up with that term, but I, when early on with, uh, with Sam Hahn, I had mentioned, I'm, you know, Lab Rat. I just mentioned it. And whether that stuck or you already knew it, I have no idea. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so um, I, my experience has has mirrored yours uh, with that, and, and it's uh, easier to kind of roll the putt where intended, right? The the start line, and so I, I'd like to think that you know putter cups help you train your eye and and yes. get your eye where you want it to go, and then hopefully yes. have putter that uh, you can consistently get it on your start line. And and I don't mean to um, put down any of the other training aids. I think. Anything that helps you do the same thing, whatever it is, over and over again, will help, right? It's, it's whatever your stroke is, as long as you're comfortable, your, your grip feels comfortable, and you can reliably kind of get it on that start line every time, all the more power to you. Um, I just, in, in my experience, I felt like I was fighting my natural putting stroke uh, more, than, more than I wanted to. Yeah. Well, let me say right now... And let me congratulate you because um, the one thing that I've noticed in all these years of talking to solopreneurs who have an idea is that you have to have a supportive partner at home. Mm -hmm. Because if you're trying to develop something and grow it and build it from nothing, from a, just an idea that you had, it, once you start hearing the fingers tapping on the on the desktop or on the, you know, uh, on no, I don't mean computer desktop. I meant like on the kitchen table, all right? Once you start hearing the noise like this, and mm -hmm. like, okay, you done yet? Did you get your jala, your lalas out? You're, you know, are you, are you ready to go back to work? If you have somebody who's not doing that, you're way ahead of the game. It's really critical to have that support at home. I'm, I am very lucky, and uh, she can relate. Uh, ballet is obviously a very different. Uh, business than than a golf training aid but she can relate in in so many ways and uh it's it's an amazing time to be doing this uh i mentioned right like i've had that kind of drive since i was a kid but the resources that are out there uh even if it had been 20 years ago i don't know if i would have been able to to make the kind of progress that i have in the time that i have just because you know you can pop open a web browser and partner with so many different uh, people with different areas of subject matter expertise, uh, whether it's computer design, whether it's prototype 3D printing, um, even finding manufacturers. It's all, it's all out there. It just requires diligence, um, patience, uh, and like <laughs> what can happen when you find out every golf hole is not exactly 4.25 inches. Uh, some course correction and some learning uh, at Trinco. I understand you do some work up in the Seattle area with First Tee. I do, I do. Um, is that man, because of Putter Cup, or is that um, independent? I got to know. I got to know First Tee uh, largely through the first chapter of my career. Um, there's a, a pretty prominent first tee fundraising scramble that happens once a year in October up here. Um, and I've played in it for 10 years, 11 years. Oh, okay. And it's always the, the, the same folks from the first tee are, are there every year. And so we've kind of become acquaintances that way. We recognize each other every year. Um, and I uh, place just so much value and appreciation for their mission. And what they do, um, because I would have been the, the perfect kid uh, to participate in it had it existed where I grew up. So I, I grew up Why in a city that? called uh, Waterbury, Connecticut. Okay. And uh, Why would you have been a great candidate for First Tee? Uh, well, as, as I understand it, it uh, supports uh, areas where kids don't necessarily have the resources to uh, go heavy into golf. Um, and I loved golf and I was lucky, you know, my, we never were, were short of food on the table, but finances were always a tension uh, in my family. And so oh, nice um, my first set of clubs was a set of Hogan Edge 
forged irons from the late 80s. It was a set of hand-me-downs from my grandfather. That was the set that I learned to play with. Um, I hope you didn't my, make you pay for those. <laughs> no, no. Uh, except for that dime. Uh, that yeah, dime exactly. That he had on his bureau from, <laughs> from beating me in match play. Uh, and then my high school was lucky to have six kids to have a golf team uh, and a, a, a volunteer teacher to coach it. And I use coach very uh, generously. Um, we're a wonderful man, but in no position to teach any of us how to play golf. It was more of like a supervisory type role. And so, uh, but I loved, I loved golf and would have been there had the first tee existed uh, in the area where I grew up um, and benefited from the lessons of golf uh, growing up. Uh, it's, it's definitely part of my, part of my DNA. Um, I can tell you. That's what I love about doing that work. I mean, I've, I've now for the last couple of months, I've been coaching on first tee, um, when I'm not traveling and, um, it's, to me, it's not so much teaching young kids and I'm working with six to 10 year olds on how to play golf. I'm trying to teach them the values that the golf, uh, imparts so that you can be a better person. Yeah. Right? And I yeah. think that golf has a lot of lessons like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I decided pretty early on that if there was an opportunity to partner with the first tee with Putter Cup, I would want to do it. Um, oh, I, be I, I believe in companies that uh, do good and do well. Um, and so uh, for now, it's, it's pretty simple and straightforward. We just donate 5% of our sales to the first tee uh, so that the more we grow, the more we can support them. Uh, who knows what the future might hold in terms of, of growing that partnership. But for now it was a great start and uh, I do, I value what, what they do for kids so much. So if I can, if I can help them to do that, I absolutely want to. That's phenomenal. Are you open to suggestions on ideas for this? Absolutely. For putter cup? Yeah. Because I have one suggestion and, you know, I've talked to so many different golf instructors, um, especially love talking to people about putting. And one of the things that even when I was uh, getting my tutorial from Sam Hahn about how to use the broomstick, um, he was going to suggest, because we were talking about pace, right? Because mm -hmm. it's not just the line, it's the pace as well. And... Uh, something I, I think I saw a video with Dustin Johnson talking about this and why his putting got so much better is that you think of the hole as a clock face uh -huh. and the direction you're coming from is six o'clock. Uh -huh. But most holes don't go in directly at six o'clock. Maybe they come in at five o'clock or seven o'clock, uh -huh. right? So my suggestion, and I think it's obvious where I'm going with this, is marks mm -hmm. you know like 12 marks just like a clock face so that you can aim for a specific mark to get the ball to roll into from that direction it's a great suggestion i love it okay we're partners now yay yeah. <laughs> one of my one of my favorite drills i'll take that do. dime from your grandfather for that idea okay deal <laughs> deal uh, one of my favorite drills to do actually with the speed bump is to take uh, 12 golf balls and make a clock face. Yep. Uh, and it's, it's not it's a long, putt; yeah. it's only three and a half, four feet. And, and the goal is to try and make all 12. I've made up to 11. I have yet to make all 12 oh, uh, because it is, it is, it's, it's tricky. You know, it, it makes, it makes the effective size of the hole smaller. Um, right. But I can say that as soon as I take it out, I do make all 12. Uh, regularly which is which is the ultimate goal that's right it's to make, amazing it, it's that's to make amazing. the real to make the real hole feel uh yeah bigger. like w i would do that drill frequently as well and when i was using uh, my 33 inch putter i would just put the the putter head in the cup and then rotate it around placing a ball at the end mm -hmm. on each one wow you know what i just realized oh my gosh with the broomstick putter mm -hmm. when they say is that inside the leather my, putter, oh my, my putter is now 40, 40 inches long. <laughs> yeah, that's in the leather. We're good. Yeah, you got a lot of gimmies coming your way. <laughs> I'm gonna. My friends are gonna hate me for that one. I'll tell you. <laughs>
Well, we do, um, to, to your point around feedback, we do have uh, a couple of exciting things coming down the pike. So um, one of the one of the things that's been the most encouraging as, as this has, has gone along is um, I've had folks from the industry reaching out. Um, and so, for example, um, I've had a number of PGA, not touring pros, but PGA professionals, teaching uh, professional, professionals, sure. yeah, teaching professionals, um, reach out and um, pick some up. Uh, and so to have folks who, like yourself, have, have seen probably everything uh, in the way of training aids, uh, to have that kind of positive uh, feedback has been really, really wonderful, um, but also retail channel. So um, I listened to your, your uh, recent episode with the co-founder of Red Rooster, and you were asking about direct-to-consumer versus the retail channel and just kind of the nature of the golf industry and how to pick the right path um, for putter cup. Certainly uh, this is something that I want to get onto store shelves. Um, that's where, you know, so much of the golfing population is, is, is likely to see something for the first time and buy it. And yep. so another great vote of confidence has been actually uh, retailers and distributors reaching out as well. Um, uh, with interest in, in potentially carrying putter cups. Uh, it's just another great kind of vote of confidence that people see something uh, that um, is on the rise and something that uh, they want to get involved with early on. So I wouldn't be too surprised if within the next few months here, you might start seeing putter cups on store shelves uh, in some retailers near you. So that's that's been a great, uh, again, great vote of confidence uh, that we're on the right direction. Um, of course, I mentioned I'm doing this all myself, uh, and that includes learning how to create content, run ad campaigns on, you know, whether it's Facebook or Instagram. And actually, just this week, we had our first kind of video go viral. Um, as of uh, the last time I looked, we're up to 85,000 views on nice. uh, on a video of the speed bump in action. Really simple video, just kind of showing how it works, right? Anything too hard, too soft or offline, it's going to punish you a little bit, but it'll make you better as soon as, as soon as it's not in the hole. Um, so if so, the PGA Superstore or Worldwide Golf come to you and say, yeah, we'd like to put these, let's start with a half a dozen of these in every one of our locations, how's your supply chain? You, can you pull it off? Oh, ready to go. Ready to awesome. go. Yeah. Yeah, and that's and that's kind of always been been the goal. Uh, I'm, I've had fun. It's certainly been a lot of great learning, uh, sure. specifically how to describe them because they're they're different from other putting training aids. Again, it's not about your stroke, it's not about your stance. It's just you in the hole as much as uh, the real thing as you can can get. Um, and so, yeah, we've we've uh, we've onboarded a new manufacturer recently uh, to increase the I think the quality a little bit. Um, we've got some nice branding now, silkscreen printed right onto the products, which makes it look real good. Uh, but we actually also have uh, a third product, and personally, uh, selfishly, but also because I think it works, uh, all three of them have uh, a distinct use case. But early on, I realized not every practice screen even punches golf holes anymore. Uh, right. Some of them just put posts in the ground. Um, and you know, to each their own, some people stick a tee in the ground and putt to a tee. But if, uh, if a golf hole is something that you want to putt to, and certainly you need a golf hole to use the speed bump in the center cup, um, those practice screens are kind of off limits for putter cup. And so, uh, I realized that. And, um, so our third product, which I, I'll, I'll describe it to folks, but it's essentially a portable golf hole. Um, it's, it kind of looks like a silicone Frisbee with uh, a golf hole cut out of the middle of it, but it employs the same benefit as the speed bump of having that kind of raised edge around the outside. So you still have to give it a little bit of speed, but not too much or it bounces over it and it's gotta be online uh, or else it'll get deflected. But now you can you can kind of get the benefits of the speed bump anywhere. And so we're calling this the to-go cup uh, and it's gonna be you know, part of what I think is going to be the 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 three pack is what you're going to likely see on store shelf. Mm -hmm. How deep is your to go cup? I mean, if you um, if you hit it in and it goes in the mm -hmm. hole, mm -hmm. but it's a little bit strong, will it bounce yeah. out and keep going? Or is it will. It, it, it can. It, it, you, 
shallow enough that it, it will hold it steady. So um, let me answer this uh, a couple of different ways because uh, like, let's say you're putting in your living room. If you have thicker carpet and that's what you're putting on mm -hmm. this height of about three quarters of an inch is, is very likely going to hold to itself. Yeah. But if you're on a practice putting green or like, let's say you're in a hotel room where your carpet is not as thick and it's running a little bit faster, um, the same speed would, would carry over the hole. And so one of the things we've done to address that is, uh, you know, I mentioned the speed bump, we updated it so that I could fit into any golf hole, regardless of what the cup situation is. You can actually take the speed bump and plug it directly into the, the to go cup. And so it oh, actually wow. adds, Great. It adds some height and it's, you know, it's very precisely engineered that it's a, you know, a perfectly flat edge there. It creates that unbroken edge. So if you are on a faster surface where it, it doesn't get to be too hard to pop it over the to-go cup, you can, you can add the speed bump in and it will give you that extra height that you need. Perfect. Perfect. And if you're feeling, uh, and if you're feeling really sadistic, you can also <laughs> plug the center cup into it as well, uh, which would give you that three and a quarter inch golf hole instead of a four and a quarter inch golf hole. So they're they're meant they're meant to complement each other uh, and and really give you the chance to benefit uh, in a number of locations. Well, I want to make sure that everybody knows that it's puttercupgolf.com. And uh, when we were running the campaign, you offered Golf Smarter listeners 20% discount if they use the checkout code Golf Smarter. Is that still in effect? It's still in effect. It's still there. Awesome. And uh, what, what's your price points? Yeah. So if you want to buy just one of them, they all sell for $17.99 mm -hmm. individually. Uh, we, of course, believe that uh, each has its own benefit. And so 96%. 96% of our, our transactions are what we call the pressure putt combo. It's both of them, both the speed bump and the center cup. Uh, and we What's the kind price of, of that? That one's $29.99. So we've kind of rewarded you know folks who are buying both. Uh, oh, yeah, great of, deal. Instead of just one. And so, yeah, with that uh, Golf Smarter Code and the 20% off of that, you're, you're getting down to, I think it's 24. Um, and then... Still TBD on what the three pack is going to cost at, okay. at retail. Um, that of course involves conversations with with the stores as well. Um, oh, yeah. But I do I do think that three pack is is what you're likely to see there. Um, I think that the to go cup is likely to have uh, the most individual demand. And you know I should note um, if you want to be notified when the to go cup is publicly available. Um, you can sign up. I've never sent to this day a single marketing email yet. Um, I receive a lot of marketing emails. And so I know yes. what it's like to be on the receiving end of them. Um, and I fully intend the, the first one I send to be the announcement that our to-go cup. Have you tried anything more. like uh, the Kickstarter or anything like that just to get the exposure and maybe even get some investment so that you can bring that one to market faster? Um, I, I have not yet. I've so far I've been able to uh, navigate without having to worry about outside investment. Um, partially, mm -hmm. that's just by uh, iterating small. And but it's also kind of, a great way to get your exposure yeah, out there and people yeah, find it's really, it. It's a really good point. It's, you're not looking; uh, these aren't going to be partners. They're just people who go, "Yeah, I yeah. want one of those," but I'm going to I'm going to buy it at a little bit of a discount now until you get it out. Yeah, there. yeah. And I, yeah. I heard I, I heard how how big of a step that was for Red Rooster. In your yes, it was. Well. Yes, it was. Yeah. Definitely well, dude, um, thank you so much for sharing this with us and uh, for coming on the show to discuss it more fully. I really appreciate it and wish you all the luck in the world. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, Fred. And, and thank you for uh, answering an email from you know an upstart golf entrepreneur uh, several months back. Uh, you're just such a, a kind ambassador uh, for this game. And so I, I appreciate how gracious you've been uh, in inviting me and, and keeping in touch as this has happened over the last few months. Fred, I'm Brandon. Hi, Brandon. Fitter here with PXG. PXG has always been ahead of the game as far as technology with the irons and definitely the wedges. But it, it's fair to say they've been a step behind all other manufacturers with drivers until this Black Ops came out. It's just like a world difference between like the past generations. Um, they don't even call it like Gen 7. They call it complete rehaul of 
manufacturing engineering and the name of it right so it's called black ops um they started with like pretty much the same very similar manufacturing process to uh callaway they've always been really good drivers it's, um, it was i was i've been much, a callaway driver guy for years it's very fair to be be one um pretty much all carbon design so the sole and the crown of the club is pretty much made all of carbon so what that does is saves the engineer weight so they can take that extra weight and put it behind the face, making the face super hot and super consistent. From what I've seen in the bays, um, definitely one of the best drivers in the market, if not the best mar- uh, driver in the market. So I'm glad you already have it. So yeah. we're not doing driver. What about woods? So we're doing, I've, I've been told it's everything from just no wedges, just irons, driver, whatever you need, but you already have the driver. Well, I have the driver. Okay. I have a... So a Callaway three wood and a five wood and a four hybrid. Okay. I'm fascinated by mini drivers. Me too. Me too. I'm yeah. waiting for them to come out with a Yeah, I'm sure I'm they will. Fascinated I'm sure by they them. will. Um, and I would like to go all the way down to my gap wedge. Okay. But not the hybrids and woods. Um, you take a peek at them. If, if they were, if, if, they were. If, if you know, if I could be a full PXU bag, I'd do it. Let's do it. All right. So you said you already warmed up? A little bit, yeah. A little bit? Yeah, I'll take a couple more swings. What are you playing with now? So, interestingly, these tailor-made QIs okay. are less than three months old. Yep. So I've been playing with these for uh, about three months, and I, 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 if I got rid of them, it's like, okay. Okay. I'm a 10.9 okay. index. i um, 69 years old. All right. So things are slowing down. You're a liar. You're 49 years old. <laughs> Thank <Just> you. <laughs> um, you're, you're younger than both my children. I can tell you right now. <laughs> How old do you think I am? 32. Correct. <laughs> good <laughs> guess, right? <laughs> I look my age. Cool. Yeah, good. Um, what is, and, like, and how often do you I get don't. to play golf? <laughs> Twice a week. Twice a week. Okay, cool. And you got a net in the backyard. I do. Nice. Putting green. How do you like this? Uh, I'm, oh, a, I'm a lab rat. Okay. I love lab golf. That's fair. I can already tell we're going to make a little bit of improvement. Awesome. So how did you get to be, did, were you trying to be a pro? A professional golfer? Yeah. No. No. No, I, uh, I was in sales and I was living in Los Angeles. I, so I was a, a car salesman by day and then by night I would do stand-up comedy. Really? And I was just so stressed out with life. I bet. And then so I grew up playing golf. I grew up playing all sports. I played college basketball. I played uh, high Where'd, school um, golf. Where'd you go to college? Uh, Saddleback Junior College. Okay. Yeah, they had a really good sports program. I got to watch them win the state championship from the view of the bench. Nice. A great view. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I was in sales, doing stand-up comedy, and just like a, just a tense, stressed human being, not having a great time. And then I started playing golf again. And I realized, like, bro, you are so much more calmer of a human being on a golf course. Like, patience, like, everything you need to be to be a human. Got a job at a golf course and at, like, a retail store. And I was doing fittings there. And then from there, I started, uh, I got a brief job as, like, a demo tech with a different manufacturer. And then from there, I was I worked for Club Champion, the fitting studio. Have uh-huh. you heard of them? Yeah. So I was there for a number of years. And then from there, I jumped to PXG. Very cool. So I kind of like, it's like, I got to be in the golf industry. Do you like PXG's product? I love it, honestly. So I've had a chance to like see all the different brands and whatnot. PXG has stuff for the better, like the tour pro player, right? We have blades and CBs. But for the amateur golfer, even if you're a scratch golfer, I met, I met a guy the other day who's a scratch golfer and he plays our XPs, our most forgiving head, because he's a little bit older and he needs the distance. Um, they definitely perform, if not one of the best, definitely probably the best. But the feel for our like our game improvement clubs or our hollow body clubs is unreal compared to like the Titleist T two hundred or those QIs. Like those to me, those feel very plastically plasticky and clicky. To where ours, even though they're hollow, they're five times forged, so it still has a nice buttery feel like a blade would, but has all the benefits of like a game improvement club. I love PXGs. I'm a two handicap, and I've hit more greens in regulation now that I switched to PXG. I'm excited. Yeah. So let's go over this a little bit. Okay. Carry numbers definitely at 150. Hey, these aren't bad clubs for you. Um, 73 mile an hour club speed. Not too concerned with that. That's how fast you swing the club, right? Right. It's not good, bad, ugly. That's just how and you I've swing. And I've come to the realization, look, if you want to hit the ball farther, 
you got to increase your body strength. There's two things that can fix that: the swing speed, uh, the gym, or a time machine. Yeah, I don't sell either of those. <laughs> so I, I'm not concerned with that. What I'm concerned with is ball speed. Uh, your ball speed is 105 miles an hour on average. So for swinging 73 miles an hour, 105 mile an hour ball speed is kind of fantastic, oh. like out of this world. The reason I say that is your smash factor. Now smash factor is going to be club speed divided by ball speed. So it's like how efficiently you're transferring energy from the club to the ball. PGA Tour average for a seven iron would be around 1.37. Right. And you're exceeding that at 1.43. And isn't like smash factor 1.5 is the ultimate goal? Isn't that it? That is the USGA legal limit on how hot a club can be. Ah. And that's usually set, that's set for a driver. So if a driver gets tested at the PGA uh, Super Show and it starts showing up at 154, 155, the manufacturer has to pull it from production and wow. redesign it because they've made it too hot. Wow. I guess uh, a couple years ago, Wilson did that, and they kind of killed their company for a couple years because they made a driver that was just crazy oh. hot. Yeah. So 150 is the max it can be, but that's gonna, you're going to see that on like a driver. So for a 7-iron, 137 is a tour average, and you're at 1.43. So keep an eye on the mailbox. Your tour card could be coming soon. <laughs> I doubt that. But yeah. Again, uh, I play from the whites. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to see something here. Where are we hitting this on the face? Oh, a little high. That's interesting. It sounded low. Launch is at 18, which is good. Spin is super low at 41. I'd say the biggest thing we, we got to do is uh, get this ball up in the air a little bit more. Really? Yeah, you're hitting at 69 feet in the air, and your land angle's at 39. PGA Tour average would be 45 to 50. And so... Wow. PGA Tour is a long way away from us. Oh, yeah. But if we can get closer to that 45 number, you're going to have a better chance than stopping the greens. Because right now, your ball's rolling out about 15 yards. And if we can cut that down to, like, 12, I'd say that's the biggest goal. Okay. Now, what's interesting is just the practice swings that I've taken so far, that yeah. looks like my ball flight. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. It's been flat, which is good. We're fighting through but the But it doesn't feel through. like, you know, feel like I've been hitting them high for me here, Yeah, which is great. But uh, you're saying higher. Yeah. And it's, it's launching good. Like, yeah. it comes off the club good. It just kind of dies out and falls out of the sky because it's not spinning at all. Your spin's at, like, 3,900. I'm going to have you hit the P head. Okay. We can go to the XP if we're not feeling the P. But the P is instantly going to get us a higher ball flight. And if you're shooting 81, you definitely can strike the ball a little bit. So you're going through the bag that has all the regular shafts in it. Yes, sir. I'm going to grab some that's a little heavier, a little lighter, and just kind of find your sweet spot as far as weight. Wow, that felt great. Yep. And looks beautiful. That seemed much higher. More ball speed on that, definitely more height. That's the ball. That was crazy. Why is that? So like I said, you hit yours mathematically almost as far as you could hit yours, and you hit that one a little further. That was 111 ball speed compared to the 106. Whoa. That's a great shot. Thank you. There we go. It's a great ball. See, when you hit it flush, it definitely gets a little higher. And I do also want to have us hit the XP, but if we were to hit the XP, I would make it two degrees weak. Going XP too weak, basically it's like it's going to match the lofts of the P, but with the forget more forgiveness. More similar to your, your QI, but with more loft. It's one of my most popular builds that I do. What are the different heads? Can you explain each yeah, of them Yeah, so this is the XP, our more, most forgiving model. It's 311. So 311 means rifleman in the Marine Corps. Everything's kind of an ode to the military because yeah. Bob Parsons. So XP's our most forgiving. The P is... Pretty much similar technology, different lofts, a little weaker lofts, but noticeably smaller head. And then you jump to the 317, it's a sniper in the Marine Corps, and the T head. So all three of these are hollow, meaning on the inside, it's forged, but on the inside it's injected with our like, on the Gen 7 it's called our quantum core. On this T it's going to be our poly core. Uh, so essentially think like a bouncy ball. So it's still very forgiving in the T and in the P, just a little bit smaller than XP. And then you got our Black Ops heads. Super game improvement, very big design. Wow. Biggest difference, one is cost, and then also it's casted instead of forged. Some people don't tell the di can't tell the difference. Right. I like to look at this as like our new to golf line. So some people come in, they're getting into golf, they're not trying to break the bank, straight to the Black Ops heads. Because they perform just as good as any of these heads, 
to me, they'll definitely feel a little different. To the guy who just started playing golf, he's not going to know the difference, except for this one probably goes a little straighter. You can see it's taller, too. Yep. You haven't really Bulkier. missed off the center. of Like, you've been left and right of the face a little bit, but you're pretty much catching that center groove. So I don't even know if this would even be that necessary for you. This being the Black Ops. The Black Ops. That's a great ball. Yeah, it looked really nice. That seemed to go forever. Yeah. It was right on line. Yeah, that was 110 ball speed. <laughs> this is the XP head. Is that the change you made? Yep. I hit it thin, but I hit it well. Still, the line was really good. That's why I love PXGs. You definitely missed that one. We, we heard it. You even said it. Yeah. That was a, the same distance as your clubs, 151 yards total. Or carry. Boom. That one went farther. That was pure. Yeah. Okay, so this works. We're going to test that first shaft, and I would definitely do the XP's too weak as far as the head. So just adding two degrees aloft. That's going to pick our height up a little bit where we need it to be. But just the construction of this club, you're hitting it way further. But I think what is cool about PXG and kind of separates us, everybody that I work with at the store has been fitting for years with other companies. It's kind of like a recruit, like they brought in really good fitters already, and then they train us on the product. Extensive training on the product. So we know the product inside and out, but as far as the fitting process, what's gonna work for certain people's swing, putting the pieces of the puzzle together as far as the numbers on the track man. Everybody I work with at the store, we've all been in the golf industry forever. And so fitting is like bread and butter to us. And I think that's what separates us right there. Shot. Yeah, that's probably the best shot so far today. Take a couple with this one. It's definitely gonna be this or that R300. Oh yeah. Wow. Wow. Me likey. Yeah, that, see that's the potential of this club. It was a <laughs> 163 yard carry. Whoa, that'll screw up my game. It'll be an adjustment period. Oh yes. Yeah. And then it's drawn at the end there. It's yep. starting off right, but it's last two come back in. It's nice. That was the kind of shot that on the driving range people go, okay, I'm done. I'm not gonna hit anymore. I don't wanna For waste sure. them. For like, sure. What does that mean? <laughs> My <laughs> grandpa used to tell me I'd be he'd take me out to the range late at night, I'd spend the night at his house. He'd be like, Papa, let me hit one more ball, I gotta end on a good one. And he'd be like, you ain't got it in your son, get in the car. We'll be here all night. <laughs> it's so hard on me all the time. <laughs> yeah, one of my listeners told me a story about that when he was young, playing with his dad. He threw, he got all upset and threw his club, and his dad said, you're not good enough to throw your clubs. <laughs> Dude, that brings back memories. My grandpa used to be, was a big time club thrower. And he told me, because we'd been playing a lot of golf that summer, he's like, Brian, I know you probably just see me cussing on the course throwing clubs. That's not, you don't do that. All right, you're a kid. It's not the way to behave on the course. It's not good. You know, don't, don't be doing that stuff. You, you have a big old long lecture on the driving range. We go to the first tee. He, he skanks his drive and then just yell, like, cusses and just throws his driver down the middle of the fairway. <laughs> right after he just told me not to do that. I'll never forget it. That's a do as I say, not as I do, Grandpa. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, I love that shot. Boom. What'd you figure out? So your, your clubs, like I said, work very well for you. 106 ball speed for only swinging 73 miles an hour. It's an outrageous amount of ball speed. You're getting every last bit out of it. A little low is 151 yards carry rolling out to 165. Now we are at 110 ball speed. Smash factor 147 for a seven iron. Just so efficient. Carry is 160. So it's nine yard, it's 160.9. So it's almost 161. So let's be fair and call it rounded up a point and a 10 yard gain of carry. It's still going just about the same height as yours. Mm -hmm. What I would suggest we do is we do make it two degrees weak in loft. The carry should probably stay at 160 because now it's staying in the air longer. It's just a less rollout. And we're hitting off of mats. Yeah. Um, we're not hitting off of grass, which I love hitting off of mats. I know, I wish I could take one with me. Yeah. I'd be, I'd be on tour if I could play off a mat. <laughs> it's sickening. I see people like, I hate warming up practicing on mats. I, I, I kind of feel the opposite. Like I like practicing off a mat because then I don't get like tormented by the game of golf. Correct. Because you, you know, a good shot is, a bad shot is still good. A good shot feels great off a mat. And so maybe you're, you're not that great of a golfer anyway. It's like <laughs> you're going to go tor torment yourself on grass. Your clubs are all dirty. Like 
at least this boosted your confidence and you take it out on the course, you're probably right. going to shoot the same score no matter what. If you're practicing on a grass or mat, you're going to shoot the same score. At least, but if anything, you have more confidence going from mat to course, you might actually score better. I completely agree with you. And to me, most of the gr grass ranges that I hid from are sand. So you're hitting off sand. So it's like, you know, because they have to refresh the grass all the time and you're not hitting off of grass, you. you're hitting off of sand. And it's correct makes it more difficult. One of the shots that I like to practice with my seven iron because of Northern California is the low hundred yard shot. Yeah. Because of uh, all the trees that I get under. <laughs> Yeah, same. I'm I'm too good at a punch cut out of the trees. Like I'm way too comfortable having to like hit a five iron 15 feet off the ground and wrap it around a tree. Too comfortable at that. Now, building of the set, do you go through four iron or five iron? Five. Five. I like it. Five, then hybrid. Uh, I had a three hybrid and a four hybrid. I jumped the three hybrid and went to a five wood. So you got three wood, five wood? Yeah, three wood, five wood. According to Arcos, I'm hitting this driver like 240 to 245-ish is like okay. the range on that. Yeah. One of the, my favorite things about my Black Ops driver is the magnet on the head cover. Yeah. That you can just kind of stick it, because I don't take carts, I always walk. But oh, I you're can just, a gangster. You walk with this bag? No, no, I'm a, I, I'm, you know. It wasn't a, a brutal walk to walk Chambers Bay. Uh, last week, which is 7.2 miles with a lot of uh, that's crazy, man. Elevation change. One of my like schools of thought with fitting mm -hmm. is that top end of the bag is where we can get more creative and really tailor it to your game, right? Like, do you need this club, that club, or the third, right? Or do you need you know a hybrid and two woods, or is it just one of each, or whatever it may be? It's got to fit not only like your ball speed numbers, but also your style of play. Oh, Bobby did you right with fitting that driver. That was pure. Kids, go to your room. Dad is home. That is what I like to say about that one. <laughs> that was popped. My caddy at Chambers Bay said, like, your driver's was the best club in your bag. You just need to get a little more confident with your irons. It's like, oh, they're still new. Give me, give me another swing or two. I, I, basically, what I'm trying to do is like, I know the average ball speed on your seven iron. Right. Now I want to get the average ball speed on your driver. Okay. And just kind of fill in the gaps between that five iron okay. and the driver. There it is, 131. Okay, I didn't even get all of it. More? No, you're good. Okay. So explain to me what you currently have in between the five iron and the driver. Hybrid, two woods. Okay, and what situations do you pull these out at? Um, 180, 200 on the five, three wood I'll go 215-ish. What's your confidence level with the woods compared to the hybrid? The, the hybrid sometimes concerns me, but I also feel like I'm in the rough. Let's pull okay. out the hybrid and don't have to hit it so hard. Okay. But I've gotten you confident like the, with these. You like the three wood and five wood? Yeah, I do. Okay. Makes sense. I almost think that it's because you hit these new irons, irons 10 yards further. That yeah, you that's going to throw my this. game off for a you while. You might not need this. Like, oh, is that right? Maybe. But it might not be that necessary, but we could just put one in the bag just just for funsies here. Okay. What do you got? Black Ops 4 Hybrid with the same shaft that's in your irons. Uh-huh. Beautiful. A little bit of a fade, but solid. Let's see if I can put it down that line there. Can you do me a favor? Can you hit your uh, hybrid a few times? Sure. That was a good shot. Really good. <laughs> Your face was like, yeah. It's good. Spins a lot. Um, I'm gonna make you something real quick. Okay. Wow. And this is a seven wood. Seven wood. Never hit a seven wood before. They're fun. It's becoming my favorite club in the bag. Is that right? Oh yeah. Instead of a hybrid? Yeah, I can't hit hybrids at all. Oh. That was pretty. Very good. Yeah, went up high. Way higher. Yeah. And is that the point of the seven wood to get it up in the air? Uh, With distance? It depends. Everyone's different. Sometimes people launch hybrids so high. Yeah. And then this usually flattens out the ball flight. For uh -huh. other people's, it's the opposite. It's a lighter head. The center, gra center of gravity is more back in the club, to whereas the center of gravity on the hybrids vary up front. Um, so some people have a tendency to hit hybrids 
a little bit hooky and they hook them a little bit and mm -hmm. they either launch real high or launch real low. When you hit this one good, it definitely goes higher. Yeah. But I don't know if it's as consistent as the hybrid is for you. You don't hit the hybrid bad. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I. Shake eponymous. Take one more. Okay. This is a prove it swing. Erase that from the memory bank. You know right here, let me help us out real quick. Let's delete that file. What are you adjusting here? I'm making the lie angle flat. And what was it before? Standard. Okay. That's better. A lot better. Hit behind it again, I heard it. Take a couple more now that it's on flat. I don't like it. You I, don't? No. Here's what we're gonna do. Put this hybrid in the bag. I have a feeling that your five iron is gonna go as far as that hybrid is. Wow. But just to be sure, out on the course, put the hybrid in the bag. But I kind of have a feeling, just like ball speed wise, like if you're, so if you're seven irons, 110 ball speed, then your uh, six iron will be 115, and your five iron will be 120. That mm. hybrid and your hybrid were both hitting 120 ball speed, mm. which means that's what your current, your new five iron is gonna be. So in theory, what you could probably your end up aiming will just be five iron, straight to five wood, three wood. Unless I'm in the rough. That's where the hybrid rescue comes into play. Exactly. Put it in the back. Beautiful. Yeah. See that ball fly right there? Yeah, that was. It's not a stinger, but it's just nice and flat. It's using spin to climb up in the air. 12 or seven would kind of just launch straight up. Yes. That's why we would go hybrid. So do you get more roll on the hybrid than on the seven wood? For you, yeah, for sure. Uh-huh. Oh yeah. Like the roll you're getting is like 15 yards from 200 yards out. <laughs> I mean, are you complaining? You know, if you hit a green from 180 yards out, it rolls up to 200, you know, the flag's in the front and you rolled it to the back of the green from that distance, you're not complaining. No, I'm not complaining. I'm taking bows. <laughs> I'm hitting it down the line every yep, time. Flat. You haven't like duff one off the turf the whole time. It's just going from sitting right here to kind of sitting like that. Yeah. Love it. Cool, cool. So for the three wood, five wood, yeah. since how you don't necessarily compress it super well, right? meaning we don't have to go any stiffer than what's in your driver, just in your driver works very well. I wouldn't want to go softer than that, just based on your speed. That's a great ball. I would keep what's in your driver into the three wood and five wood. Uh -huh. Usually that's a good place to be, just kind of match the woods. Yours is a 55 gram, we'll go 65 gram in the three and the five. Unless someone like cannot compress the ball or they compress it too much, then we'll have to go softer or stiffer. That's not the case here. Get you the three and the five in the same setup as the driver. Cool. Oops, inside out. There you go. Didn't love the swing, but I like the result. It worked out. Good ball. Thank you. Yeah, so I'd put the three wood and five wood on flat as well. Okay. The hybrids in the woods are on flat, the irons are on standard. Interesting. But too weak and long. Okay. Love it. Love it. All right, so we're done? Done, we're good. Listen, I, as I went to college to study radio and TV production and have spent my entire adult life recording one thing or another, I really enjoy slapping a wireless microphone on myself and whomever I'm talking to or playing with, like we did with Sam Hahn a couple weeks ago or my round at the Olympic Club with Eric Schulberg back in June. Uh, and I'm still editing the conversation I had with my caddy at Chambers Bay, and that's coming up in a couple weeks. But I'd really love to hear your thoughts and feedback on these remote recordings that I do out in the field. And do they work in the podcast? And again, even though PXG is going to be paying for an ad campaign that starts next episode, this segment was not paid for. But I really do appreciate their support. This week's Golf Smarter Ambassador was Mike Harley from Loudoun, Tennessee. As a Golf Smarter Ambassador, Mike has received a free link to Tony Manzoni's video of The Lost Fundamental, which was his gift just for sharing with us where he plays, where he lives, and which episode number this is. I'd like to invite you to also be a Golf Smarter Ambassador and choose from one of three great gifts that you'll receive once you play. All you need to do is introduce a future episode. Just write to golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com and I'll get back to you with some very simple instructions on how to play. If you have any questions, comments, feedback on remote recordings, or suggestions for upcoming episodes, please write to golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com or click on the Hey Fred button when you visit 
GolfSmarter.com.